Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Cloud Skills Show. Uh, my name is Adam Jackson. We are on week three of Cloud Skills this week and you're very, very welcome. This week, we've got a fantastic AI special coming up um, hosted by the wonderful Amy Boyd and we'll introduce her in just a second. Um, but first, before that, I'm just gonna introduce you to the people that we're gonna see on screen today. So we're gonna start off with Jamie McGuire. He's gonna be talking about a developer's perspective on AI and machine learning. He's got some wonderful demos. Um, and then we're gonna meet Tempest Van Skyke. Um, she's based in the US. Uh, it's not too early, she's based on the East Coast, so it's just 9 a.m. there. Um, but she's a data scientist with Microsoft's commercial software engineer, and, and also she's a biomedical engineer as well. So she's got some really interesting um, and stuff to share, um, particularly around AI and ethics. And then we're going to meet um, Edvige Seminara and Sami Deprez, um, and they're from our global AI community, and they're almost also um, Microsoft MVPs in the AI space. And then we're going to finish off uh, by meeting Emily Clark again, who some of you met last week, and she's actually just started on AI fundamentals on Microsoft Learn, so she's brand new to AI, and she's going to be telling us what she knows. So um, I am Adam Jackson. I am not going to be on air all the way through this show. So um, you're going to see me at the start and the end only. Um, but we're really, really, uh, really um, privileged to be joined by Amy Boyd, who I think a lot of you actually met on um, this year's Microsoft Build. Um, and Amy is a cloud advocate with Microsoft. She is in the AI space. She's built a huge amount of AI content and um, she, will be, uh, she will be talking you through today's agenda. Amazing. Thank you so much, Adam. What an incredible introduction. Way to make me feel really good before we uh, start with all of our amazing guests as well. So yeah, we have so much to cover. Adam just showed how many different people we're going to be chatting to today. It was really important to me to on a, a, a skills show to show that you can come in from any place that you need to. So whether you're brand new, whether you're really, really experienced, and hopefully there's always something we can learn. And so first up, I'm going to be talking to Jamie. Um, Jamie McGuire is one of our AI MVPs, um, but also has some really, really interesting stories. And he's going to be talking to us from a developer's perspective. So hi, Jamie. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Amy. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, no, no, thank you for, for being here. Um, so first things first, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're up to at the moment? Yeah, so I'm a senior developer. Uh, for the last few years, I've been building conversational agents using the Microsoft Bot Framework. So building chatbots and creating integrations with uh, Azure Cognitive Services just to kind of augment their capabilities and, and add more and more features. Um, out with all of that, I'm also doing a lot with social media API integrations and again using AI services to surface like signals that are well, that are of interest to, to businesses and, and, and clients and stuff like that. Nice, very nice. And I guess first question, how did you get into AI? What's, what's your story in this space? Yeah, uh, my story goes back quite a few years. Um, so it was really about 2012, 2013. I was, uh, I was working for a consultancy um, who were kind enough to pay for a, a master's degree for me. And uh, part of that was a three-year course, um, but it was a 12-month um, project that involved uh, me basically building out an API. Um, and what that API involved was like um, constructing code to help me perform sentiment analysis and all that sort of thing. So I was do this last, lasted, as, as I say, for, for about 12 months. Um, but my main interest was seeing how I could then take this API and then use that to tap into conversations on Twitter and basically like the public uh, consciousness. And um, But what I found was that tr traditional coding techniques weren't enough for me to be able to like fix out these problems. I thought I could just create like a, a dictionary and a corpus and some regular expressions and all that sort of thing. And um, kind of like your big data situation where you've got, you know, you've got the scale and the volume of the data, the variety and just the, the sheer speed or velocity of the data coming through. Mm -hmm. I, couldn't, I couldn't solve this problem using regular uh, coding patterns or, or um, approaches. So what I, what I found was throughout that whole year was there was a, a technique that I could use called Bayesian theorem. And that was like an algorithm, right? and that helped me deal with this data at scale mm -hmm. but in order for me to you know surface the signals that i was interested in it involved quite a lot of work so i had mm -hmm. to build the algorithm build the model had to source some training data had to cleanse that had yeah to had to test it um and it was like a hell of a lot of maintenance as well 
Yeah, um, I was going to say, especially with you talking about social media data, goodness me, whenever I've done anything with social media data, cleansing, I, we make a joke, don't we, that like cleansing is 70% of the project sort of thing in most machine learning projects. This actually is like social media data is a mess <laughs> in most cases. Yeah, yeah, to totally. And and to try and make more sense of that, that mess and find more signal in the noise, mm. I then started to find out about things like um, natural language processing and named entity recognition and part of speech tigers. And those techniques help me um, identify popular keywords and locations and even down to the users that were being mentioned. Um, and what I ended up with was like this assorted quilt of APIs in code, right? And it just started to get a little bit messy. Mm -hmm. And it was around about that point in time where, and I, so I wrapped up that project and um, submitted it and that was all good and fine. Um, and about a year passed, right, Amy? And uh, Azure Cognitive Services started to, you know, fla flash up on my radar. And I, I started to notice things that I was like, oh, hold on a minute. I get sentiment out of the box. Oh, there's named entity recognition. So I started to kind of roll back some of the stuff that I had been building. Um, and out with all of this, there was another initiative going on that I, I caught wind of. Um, uh, a development initiative that Twitter had going on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. tell us more about that, because didn't that like super fast track this project? Yeah, yeah, so, so what ended up happening, right, was like I, I had this custom code base and then I had, um, I started to swap bits of it out for cognitive services and Twitter had this initiative and I was like, hold on a minute, I started to join a few dots, I was like, this API can maybe be something. Mm -hmm. um, and what Twitter were looking for was um, developers or the, the community to build um, product products in and around the ad tech and marketing space. Right. So I was like, okay, I could use this API to identify particular signals and then maybe serve creative or messages and whatever, you know, thinking really the, um, how can I say, the finding the right person at the right time and then serving them with the, the right creative, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes it. I mean, we see it a lot, don't we, with like recommendation engines and stuff like that. Yeah, targeting the right people, you know, not targeting me for a lawnmower, for example. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, 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 that was exactly it. So I, I built a, a ASP.NET web application on the front of this API. Mm. And, and then I basically, um, I basically submitted that. And that happened on three separate occasions. Um, um, and just as I say, using custom code and cognitive services, I was able just to find more signal in, in the data that I was looking to to, to analyze. Really, um, that was also a, a good networking opportunity um, as, as well. That opened mm. quite a few a few different doors, um, which uh, was quite quite an exciting thing actually. Because what ended up happening was um, I got a few invites over there. Mm -hmm. uh, demo the software, but what what I learned throughout that period was that you know I, I'd done all of the research for Bayesian theorem and stuff over the over the twelve months, and I built the algo in mm -hmm. C sharp. I had the API, but as I kind of touched on the other, it was it was a lot of work, man. Like, yeah. Um, and that's when, as I say, I just started to swap stuff out for off the shelf APIs. I kind of, I kind of coined this. Really. I think we're living a little bit of an API economy, yeah. and, right? I do because I could, I could just pull this stuff off the shelf, uh, so, and 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 by doing that, I could then focus on learning like uh, another vendor's API, well, basically like the Twitter APIs. Yeah, uh, I could focus on those problems rather than the kind of low level fundamentals of like calculating the probability of you know what's happened before and what's about to happen and classifying the data, building the training model and all that sort of stuff. So um, that, that, was a, that was a big win for me really um, mm -hmm. in, in doing that. And so kind of, it feels a bit like, uh, so Henk on our team, Henk Bowman, for anyone who, who wants to find him on Twitter, uh, he's a card advocate at Microsoft and we were chatting um, the other day and he uses the phrase build versus buy uh, to, right. to do that that sort of, um, do we want to do a bespoke machine learning algorithm or do we actually want to um, kind of keep Build, build our own thing or actually pull in and use cognitive services or any other provider as well, right? And as you're saying, like, how much effort was it for you to build all those different APIs, maintain all those different APIs, um, but then realize like, oh, you can just like do all of this stuff with, with like one API call. It's, yeah. um, 
<laughs> don't let it be disheartening, obviously, but it's, uh, I think the, the value, interestingly, that I keep picking out of your story is you applied it. Like it was where you took that and like what data it was able to give and actually what you acted on almost. Um, is, that what, is, is that kind of where you, you saw some value? Yeah, yeah. So th that 12-month that block, was um, it was a hell of a lot of work, and the the low level um, algorithm itself was you know that was all fine and well, and that was just like real low level. That was just like um, basically calculating a probability based on incoming data, mm -hmm. but which is fine. But to generate the real value, I had to try and build like an MVP product around that. Right. Um, that would that, that I could then demo. I couldn't do that with an algorithm alone. Mm -hmm. So it had to be all encompassing. Like, so like that algorithm was just one part of it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I always think of it as like jigsaw pieces. Like you can't have the full jigsaw, like machine learning is like a couple of pieces potentially. And then the actual picture comes into play when you, like you said, oh, I just built like an ASP.NET web app on the front of it. Well, like as a developer, you say things like, oh, I just built that. But like for lots of other people in the space, that would be a massive thing. So like, yeah, I think you know, developers are integrating into the AI space so important for that like end to end almost. Yeah, you, you've got to have the, uh, you've got to have all the blocks in place, haven't you? Um, it's, it's uh, otherwise you get nothing to demo really. It's, it's not much of a demo if you've only done <laughs> showing a number on the screen. It's, uh... <laughs> That's amazing. And um, sorry, we are just having a few momentary technical issues. Um, Well, I'm terribly sorry. I'm afraid we lost everyone for a second there, but we are back. Um, had a little bit of a technical issue there, but um, let's go back straight back into that conversation with um, Amy and Jamie. Oh, no, no problem at all. That's the world we now live in, right? Like internet connections are king. It's, um, it really is the, the be all and end all. But yeah, sorry, Jamie, we, we got interrupted there. We were talking about kind of that full end to end piece of um, architecture being so important. And I guess with our kind of final few moments, I think you've got something to show us, right, that you built around some Instagram and Twitter data. And it might bring this conversation to life for people. Yeah, so what happened was I was doing a little bit of freelance work um, and what this client were looking to do was uh, look at social data, mainly Twitter and Instagram data, uh, to help them find signals on social to help improve environmental and animal welfare. Um, and they wanted to look beyond the kind of um, the sort of like you know, your obvious metrics such as likes and shares and all that sort of stuff. Um, and what I basically done was I built a a set of integrations that could connect to the Instagram Graph API in, in .NET, and that's what yes. we can see. That's what we can see here. So what I've got is like a, a demo application that's hooked up to a live Instagram account. I mean, I'm not act massively active on Instagram, but these are just. Are some you tests. not? Are you no. not, Jamie? I feel I, like I'm, it's it's all about the gram, isn't it? <laughs> so, I, so I hear Amy. So I hear. Uh, <laughs> I need to get some tips off one of my sisters. So um, these are just so, some images on, on on the account. Um, you can. We can quickly have a quick uh, click on that link and have a look over just to check that they're actually um, active. So you can see there's some test comments. We've got a, a lady drinking a bottle of coke. We've got a couple of brands in there and some comments and some hashtags. Um, I'll jump back out the Instagram website itself. So that's a live image. And then here we're just pulling down the metrics, okay? Uh, however, if we click on some of the details here, it's going to take us into some further insights that have been derived using text analytics and computer vision. 
Nice. Uh, so yeah. there's you know, like likes and comments and impressions. They're some of the right basic metadata we get with social media, but you're kind of like making that even richer by extracting like what's actually going on in the post. That, that's that's exactly it, Amy. So further down here, we've got some comments, we've got some sentiment in the, the stronger performing keywords in, in each of the comments. Um, a little bit further down here, we can see <clears throat> some more of the keywords and phrases that have been identified in, in the hashtags, such as marketing and digital some of the entities such as Coca-Cola, but it's in the image uh, classification insights. So we're using computer vision here. And this is where I think the um, uh, some of the, the, the kind of richer value is, to be honest, because it, historically it's been pretty difficult to classify images, but with yeah. computer vision, you can just, you've got a bunch of pre-trained um, vision models that let you surface these insights. Mm -hmm. So we'll, here we've got tags, brands, and objects. We can see, you know, if we quickly jump back out into the image, we've got oh, a lady who's drinking a bottle of Coca-Cola. Um, we can see here our computer vision is identified. We've got a person with a drink, there's a bottle, there's a beverage, it's a soft drink. We've identified brands and objects. Um, and then Image description of, is always fascinating for me. Like the fact that it says like a woman holding a bottle posing for the camera. Like, yeah, this is an advert. Like she's, po I don't know, that's so subtle. I think something like that, that's like human subtle sort of advertising thing, isn't it? Where they, they make it feel real, but actually it's it's got that from within the image. It's very impressive. I I, I think that, that that's incredible to me. Um, mm. That This hasn't been, I haven't had to do anything to do this, right? Yeah. And it's almost like the, the um the camera becomes the keyboard in, in a sense right so you could just take a, take a picture right and just at the box you got all this all of these insights that you can then report over cleanse and do whatever you want with um so that was and then there's a little bit further down here where what we're doing is you know dynamic recommendations and suggestions based on the content so that again is just adding more value based on the data that's been being processed through the cognitive services stuff um, so yeah, yeah, that was that. That was that. Um, that project, that proof of concept. That's perfect. And just to confirm, so all of that information there was out of the box APIs. That wasn't because I know you can build it. You took, you went through the academic um, understanding yeah. and the theory, but technically, this is this is the calling the APIs. Yeah, all all all, all, of, all of this what you see here is, is being mm -hmm. done via the APIs. Like the year long project that I was on was yeah. cent centered around passing out data to get at this information. Right. But but what I've done is what I've done is I've swapped that out because mm -hmm. it just purely from a, a, a development and maintenance perspective, I don't mm -hmm. have to I don't have to get any more training data. I don't have to cleanse it. I don't have to continually monitor the accuracy. Sometimes yeah. I was getting accuracy up to like eighty percent. Sometimes it would drop down to like 60 or 65. It would just depend on the training data. Right. Uh, uh, but with this, I don't have that problem, you see, because I just, you know, pull it off the shelf and plug it in. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Jamie. We are going to cover so much in the show. I'd love to stay and chat with you more and more about all of the different APIs. I know you're doing amazing stuff in the bot space as well. So um, if you're looking for a follow on and you want to read some of Jamie's amazing stuff, I've got a great call to action link for you here. So aka.ms slash cs dash Jamie Insta or dash Jamie Twitter as well. And you can go, there we go. And you can go and check them out. Um, I know I'm going to certainly be reading some of them i've had a quick glance at a few um and so yeah do go and check those links out thank you so much jamie for joining us and uh yeah hopefully we'll bring you back at the end to say to say a, a thank you overall but and, adam and, and yeah i mean it's definitely worth saying and we share all of those links at the end and some more as well so we'll have a we'll have a blog um with all of those links and and sorry if you missed about uh, 30 seconds of uh, of content from there hopefully i didn't didn't spoil your viewing experience too much but uh it looks like we we got everyone back so fantastic amazing so should we dive straight into the next one we're already uh 20 oh, minutes God. past the hour and we've got so much still to go um so next up, we have talked about the developer's perspective. And now I love this. That we're, oh, you're moving. I was like, now we're going to talk about the data scientist perspective. Oh, this way. There we go. Ah! <laughs> the data scientist perspective. And we're going to be joined by Tempest. So Tempest, thank you so much for joining us and offering uh, your time to chat about the data scientist perspective. First things first, uh, tell us a bit about who you are and what you do at Microsoft. Yeah, so my name is Tempest van Skyke, and I am a senior data scientist at Microsoft uh, in a team called Commercial Software Engineering. And I work mainly on healthcare, 
um, so hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, um, and that's because I'm a biomedical engineer by training. Nice. Gosh, many, many skills there. Many, many skills. And um, yeah, we've had a chance, the opportunity to work together in the past, which has been incredibly fun. But first things first that I want to know is how did you get into AI? So same question as we asked to Jamie, but I think you have quite a different path. Yeah, so I um, studied in South Africa, where I'm from, at Wits University. I studied biomedical engineering as my first degree. Um, so there I was learning about kind of medical technology, um, computer vision uh, for medical diagnostics, but it was quite, let's say, old school um, computer vision. Right. Um, and then I did a degree in electrical and electronics engineering. Um, so a bit unusual to undergraduate degrees. Um, and there, you know, we learned about neural networks, um, but it was it was not very fashionable at the time. Mm -hmm. It was kind of in the AI winter, I believe. Ah, I see. Um, so it, there was not a, a lot of excitement about neural networks, but um, those are both really good foundational degrees for, mm -hmm. for, for data scientists. Um, so then I uh, went to London to study my PhD at Imperial College. And I did my PhD in bioengineering. Um, and I focused on medical sensors, like really tiny sensors um, that are implantable and um, kind of focused on time series data and signal processing. Um, and then became interested in these, in these sensors that are collecting data, right? So small sensors, um, then worked in a, a startup working with genetic data, worked uh -huh. in another startup working with wearable sensors mm -hmm. that are collecting medical data in, in everyday settings. Um, so I started, um, my interest started with medical data and shifted to the data analysis. So not only building cool sensors, but what can we learn from the data from these sensors? Mm -hmm. um, so that was really sort of as, as AI was kind of taking off in the, you know, sort of 2012, 2014, that's mm -hmm. when um, I sort of shifted my focus uh, to the data analysis itself. Um, oh, yeah, and then joined, worked in startups and joined Microsoft a few years ago. Oh, fabulous. That is, a, that is a journey, right? All sorts of different areas and then from that domain, um, almost like an IoT segment to it as well. I feel Ooh. with those tiny, tiny devices and how do we collect, you know, data from from real life, right? The things that you just have on you or, or in you, I guess, for um for, for such long periods of time and then obviously uh, collecting and analyzing that data. I love that, like full full spectrum of all of the skills. And so in your intro, you spoke a little bit about commercial software engineering. Can you tell us a little bit more about, um, well, internally it's CSE, but commercial software engineering, um, what you guys do and also uh, how, how you work with customers? Yeah, so, so we work, um, we collaborate with Microsoft's customers to help solve their most challenging problems. So um, if they need to build like bespoke machine learning algorithms and, and systems. Um, so for, for any machine learning project, we have a team made of data scientists and software engineers. Uh, and we work with customer data scientists and software engineers and we all collaborate to solve a problem. Um, so I think what's, important about our team is that our data scientists don't work in isolation. Um, we don't just produce experimental notebooks and then throw them over the wall to mm -hmm. software engineers. Um, we actually collaborate very closely with software engineers to put machine learning models into production. And we, we define at the beginning of a project, we define um, a, a piece of time for data exploration and experimentation. Uh, which is very important for, for data scientists to, to do. Um, but then as the, uh, the project progresses, we have, um, we work in the same repo, same code repo as the software engineers. Um, we have a shared backlog. We write unit tests for our data science code. Um, and this is also a trend that uh, we see in customers teams as well, um, where the kind of data scientists and software engineers are coming together. Uh, the, the the job descriptions are getting a bit blurred and mm -hmm. the responsibilities are are kind of merging, uh, which I think is a, is a good thing, uh, bringing these two sides together. That's really cool. I was going to say, and I, it's so good to hear because we do 
I, sometimes I, I'm terrible for it. I even like play up to it a little bit sometimes in stories where it's like, yeah, you know, you have in the past, like data scientists working on their own. And as you said, throwing these experimental notebooks over the wall and developers being like, what on earth am I going to do with this? It's so good to hear, but also the other way around, right? There's a lot of software engineering practices that are going directly into data scientists' uh, skill sets as well um, and, uh, and allowing you to unit test and source code control and kind of all that good stuff. So it's so good to hear kind of, yeah, the working together and not and not just the, oh, and I do this bit and, and you do this bit, which I think we know in tech, like we have to be a little bit more flexible now almost like, you know, with the cloud, even I've got into infrastructure and infrastructure is not my area at all, but understanding and, and appreciating kind of what's going on in the uh, peripherals of the, the place you sit is, is incredible. And yeah. um, you obviously mentioned you work in healthcare and we've talked a bit, um, a lot of people are saying like right now with the situations that we're in, digital transformation is like being pushed forward. Are you seeing that kind of thing uh, with, within your industry uh, focus as well? Yeah, totally. So, um, like I said, I work in the healthcare and data science. So, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been, uh, definitely an interesting time for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I saw, I think it was, a, it was a joke on Twitter. Someone said, who's responsible for the digital transformation in your company? A, the CTO, B, the CEO, and C, COVID-19. Um, so I've definitely seen that happening. So, mm-hmm. Um, different organizations are really pushing to digitize their health data. Um, I mean, a lot of it is still paper-based, but if you digitize it and kind of put it on the cloud, um, then you can actually learn something from it and use that data to, to gain insights. So there's definitely been an acceleration there. Um, but also, I've seen organizations are taking stock of what data they have, uh, what digital data they have. So it's mm-hmm. digitized, but... Where exactly is it? Um, you know, what, what what are the tables called? What information is actually in that in that database or in that folder? Um, and how is all this data joined up? So I've seen organisations have really tried to suddenly map where all their data is so they can make sense of it. That's good. Um, That's good because because you hear a lot about data silos within business, and then it's like, oh, you know, there's this database over there, and we think it's got something like this in it, and it might be useful for what we're doing. But yeah, understanding that much better, it's it's really great to hear that that design task or that um, I guess a checking in task is, is kind of happening as well. It's that's it's very impressive, right, to be able to uh, understand exactly where and where and when you need all your data. Yeah, and, and um, initially, it's, it's interesting to see how the different um, kind of COVID projects for data scientists have evolved in in the couple couple of months that we've been in this in this new world. Um, so initially, a lot of the organisations were wanting to wanting data scientists to model the disease uh, and model model the spread of disease. So everyone was 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 an epidemiologist in in March and April. Yeah. Um, and then the focus shift to, shifted a bit to things like algorithms to allocate um, PPE uh, to hospitals in need. Um, mm-hmm. And then it shifted again now more towards how do we return people to work safely. So it's um, it's been that's been quite interesting how quickly the the focus has shifted. Yeah, I was going to say, like you said, like some of this stuff would sometimes come around in the past, and you'd be like, oh no, there's kind of a new focus, but. I guess it's when there's a need for a direct need for something and everyone dives in on that problem, which is which is great, right? We tend to get you know somewhere and solve some of these things. So it's incredible to hear what's happening um, in the space that you're working in. And I guess um, one of my other uh, interesting angles, I know we've spoken about this before, is you're obviously working with customers. You're encouraging them to not only build uh, and take to production, but actually like continue and, and you learn with them as well and, and test things out. With that obviously comes things moving into production. Are you working closely with people on responsible AI as well um, and, and how how they act on it? I think a lot of us know that it's, it's happening. We, we hear the stories. We understand the products that maybe aren't working as well as we want to uh, when they go out into the real world. Um, but how, how do you talk to customers about that kind of stuff? How, how do you make it actionable? Right, so, you know, I said we collaborate with data scientists and engineers from customer side. Um, 
And that's really important to because we get that domain knowledge and that's super important. I think it's um, it's it's possibly even irresponsible for data scientists to work with data if they don't understand what the data means. And so that, that um, subject matter expertise is really, really important um, in building a, a responsible AI. Um, so actually for every project we do, um, in commercial software engineering, we have to follow responsible AI standards. Mm-hmm. Um, so that whether we're developing a new model from scratch or we're deploying an existing model, we have to do that responsibly. And so we have to consider how this machine learning system could be used or misused, um, how it could affect different stakeholders that might uh, be affected by it. And what I've found, and I like that the responsibility is on us, it's on the data scientists, it's on software engineers, as well as um, social scientists and and ethicists and lawyers. Um, And I found that you can't just hope that a model is fair and cross your fingers. You actually have to actively do something about it. Mm -hmm. So you have to actively ask questions and think who's going to answer the questions and actively write some code and build in systems into machine learning um, uh, in production. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so for example, what, what that can look like, what I've been seeing is actively building interpretability into a model so we can understand why it's making those predictions mm-hmm. or actively checking on the fairness of a model um, and, and that's something that I've been looking at recently. Nice, nice. And so you mentioned uh, checking in on fairness um, and then like obviously like metrics. How do these two things come together? How, how have you made that like real, that word fairness in some senses? Um, so when thinking about responsible AI um, and taking action, I was kind of researching different tools uh, that, that we could use. Um, so I found this, this, this tool called Fairlearn. Um, let me share my screen. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Let's take a look. Uh, I think it'll bring, bring it to life for people. Give me a second. There we go. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so, uh, so I found this package called Fairlearn, um, which is a Python package. Uh, it kind of brings the the state of the art thinking on fairness from Microsoft Research and puts that into a Python package, which makes it much more accessible to to developers and data scientists. Um, it has two components. It has the assessing whether a model is fair, and then the next component is mitigating against unfairness. Um, and obviously, uh, um, a Python package is not going to guarantee that um, the whole machine learning system is fair, but it does um, it does help you think about specific types of unfairness, um, uh, specific uh, they call the quality of service and allocation unfairness. Um, so the part I've been using is uh, the the assessment and the metrics. Um, so. Uh, so the way that the metrics work is, um, imagine you, you define an, an accuracy for, for a model. So you've got a model that's making predictions and you define accuracy. And then you want to see, is this model equally accurate for different groups uh, in the population? Yeah. So for example, is it equally accurate for men and women? Um, so you can define, um, you can define this whatever accuracy metric and then look at different subgroups. So in addition to the Python package, there's also um, a dashboard for visualization. Um, So I think this is looking at at earnings uh, for men and women. And you can see how how accurate it is uh, for for, uh, female and male there. And then uh, you can kind of select whichever accuracy metric you like. You can see how it performs um, and what types of of errors, either under-predicting or over-predicting, um, and a couple of, of useful metrics uh, for looking at um, at fairness. And for me, the interesting thing is you don't you don't need to have uh, trained the model on these sensitive features. So you could train the model on on whatever data you have, 
And then you might look at, is it equally accurate for people in rural areas and urban areas? Mm -hmm. And that data was never in your training set, but you can still kind of uh, slice it and see if it's fair. Um, so this is something that I found uh, quite useful recently. Yeah, and you mentioned like how important it is, right, for, uh, you always said it's, it's almost, um, you know, you shouldn't be doing it as a data scientist unless you understand the data. It kind of feels like this is another another metric uh, that we should all build in that says actually, yes, I build the model um, and then I need to reassess it again afterwards and that says, do I truly understand what it's doing? And being able to dive into all those visualizations, that dashboard looked uh, impressive. So yeah, that's that's super interesting. And, and have customers found that um, easy to pick up and, and nice to continue using? Have you heard some feedback on that? Yeah, so I think the customers uh, that we've spoken to have been very um, open to this kind of work, which is great. I think it probably helps that it's um, kind of a, let's say, kind of a hot topic. You know, you see it at conferences and yeah. um, it's in the news. So, so customers have been really open to that conversation, which is which is great. That's amazing. Oh, well, thank you so much, Tempest, for joining us. It's been a, a treat to take us through what you do, what's happening happening in the healthcare space, and then also seeing some of this stuff in action and, and how real it's, it's becoming, as you said, not just the conversation, but actually how we acted on it. And so um, there is actually a really nice uh, learn module, uh, Microsoft learn module on uh, mitigating unfairness in Azure machine learning using those fair learn packages. So if you go to aka.ms slash cs dash ml dash bias, uh, you can go ahead and start learning this for yourself. And um, Tempest, thank you so much for joining us and showing us our, your data scientist perspective. Thanks for having me. Amazing. Okay, um, Adam, how are we doing on time? Are we are we all good? We are we are all good. We are all good. Yes. Fantastic. So let's fly into the next section. So what have we done? We've done developers. We've done data scientist perspective, and now we're going to go and have a look at the community perspective. And I've invited two fabulous people on to speak to me. Um, we've got Edwidge and also Sammy. Both of you are huge uh, contributors to the global AI community, um, but also just fa fa oh, sorry, losing my words. F uh, fantastic contributors to the AI community in general uh, with, with the amazing content that you're putting together. Um, so welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. You Thank are you. more more than welcome. So um, we're, as we only have a few minutes of time, um, Edward, can we start with you? I would love to just ask you a bit about yourself. So what is it that you, you do day to day? Um, but also, how have you got involved with the global AI community? Yeah, of course. So um, I discovered uh, the global AI community. So uh, my day-to-day -day life is uh, uh, a technical uh, lead day-to-day uh, -day life. So um, <laughs> helping uh, customers and teams uh, that would like to deliver um, AI projects. Uh, and uh, I became AI MVP a few years ago uh, by providing and sharing. Thank you. <laughs> uh, by providing and, uh, and sharing um, lots of content for communities or companies in conference, meetups, or different kinds of events. Uh, and I discovered the, the global AI community when I was looking for uh, a new communication channel with AI communities. I mean, uh, I was searching for a more global and uh, international way to meet people uh, um, as passionate as I am about AI and outside of my country. Because there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of people that are passionate about uh, AI in France. Uh -huh. Sorry for my French accent. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, the, the, my purpose was um, to to share knowledge and technical tips about tools, cloud platform, and AI use case, but. Uh, in international way, because we are always talking about bias uh, in AI and lots of uh, topics. But I think, yeah, you know, if we are talking about bias, it's it makes sense to interact all over the world uh, and yeah. across the world. I was going to say, right, that, that that is one of the the recommendations when we talk about responsible AI in general, isn't it? It's like 
think about the team that you work in, but also encourage others to uh, deep dive or comment on what you're building so that you do get someone else's perspective on, you know, actually, you know, that might not work for someone that they know or something like that. Yeah, you know, you're, you're hopefully going to have a little bit more diversity there. That's super interesting. So what's happening in, in Global Hour community at the moment? Have we, have we got some stuff coming up? I say it as uh, if yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We have uh, we have a lot uh, of uh, events that are coming soon. Uh, I started to organize, uh, and I think it's the same for Sami. Uh, I started to contribute in the global AI community with local events. I mean, physical events. Yeah. But you know, it, it turned into uh, virtual events. <laughs> of of course. <laughs> yeah, we we it's uh, it's an obligation right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a lot of. Um, uh, events that are coming. I mean that it's in op October, if my if my uh, if I have a good memory. Yeah. Um, and we have also um, global um, AI virtual talks each yeah. week. Yes, nice. right here. There we go. Um, there are there, there was some uh, global AI uh, virtual tour a um, few months ago. And uh, yes, I, I mean, uh, I think we will continue to, we will continue in this way to share and interact um, virtually first and uh, in the future when it will be possible physically. Yeah, I was going to say the virtual tour happened, it was literally like March or st start of April, wasn't it? And um, that was when everything was it just changed. I remember it kind of flying okay. online and completely changing the approach uh, very, very quickly. So it was incredibly impressive how the team kind of banded together and, and made that happen. And you can actually get access to those that previous um, edition. There's like a whole load of YouTube videos um, yeah. of all the different talks. There was a particularly good talk. I keep talking about it, I feel like, on every um, conversation I have with people. Um, it was like about um, using automated machine learning on Kaggle mm -hmm. competitions. And I was like, yeah. I had never, like, I genuinely, I don't know why. I was just like, maybe you can't use automated machine learning because it kind of, like, does it for you. But um, it was very, very impressive to see how that could be kind of applied. And um, there's a whole host of different talks. But speaking of lots and lots of different talks, um, Sammy. Sammy is the owner of AI Talks. Tell us more about AI Talks and how people can tune in. All right. So AI Talks is a weekly YouTube show that we are that is streamed on the Global AI Community channel, and we organize talks uh, for beginners, from experts about, uh, for example, about ethics, but as well as just specific uh, Microsoft products or even other products. Uh, there's no well, we we have also sessions, for example, about OpenCV, which is an open source project. Uh, so it's, it's, as I said, for, it's for everyone. And the cool thing is, it's again, it's online. So everyone can watch it. If you're living in the US or you're living in Australia, well, if you're not, can't watch it online live, then you can still watch it, uh, of course, uh, just on YouTube. So Fantastic. we have a website that is shown right now, uh, mm -hmm. globally dot community slash AI talks or the short link here on the bottom uh, where you can find if you scroll a little bit to the bottom uh, all the episodes that are planned at the moment like tonight there's a really awesome talk going on about software testing combined with AI um, and then we have many more so for sure check out uh, our upcoming events our agenda is already full until the end of October but of course if you have a session that you would like to share please just send me a tweet and uh, for sure uh, I will respond to you with appropriate measures. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And yeah, there's so much good stuff, like the, the stories and the different approaches to, that people are taking in those talks. Like it's not just, oh, another talk about another product. Like, like you said, it's a kind of a lot about some of the peripherals and the software engineering that goes around AI as, as well as, you know, the real latest and greatest that's happening. Yeah. So yeah, it's we an have amazing mix. Also specific for, for example, for people who want to move from software developer to data scientist. That's one of our next sessions, I think, in two weeks. So for those people, it might be very interesting also. That's really cool because that feels like quite the abyss, doesn't it? Like there's this big gap between developer and data scientist. Exactly. Amazing. And so uh, you mentioned there's one tonight. There's an AI Talks tonight. So if people are keen, um, they should go ahead to the website, go find out if that talk is for them. Um, 5 p.m. And... Central European time. 
5 p.m. Central Europe, so uh, early morning US it will cover as well, and if not, obviously, catch up on demand as well. So, so thank you so much, Sammy and Edwin, for joining us. Um, it's been amazing to talk about the global AI community. Um, and, yeah, just, like, keep doing amazing stuff. And I guess if we have other um, incredible speakers or people who have just built a really cool project, um, they should get in touch with you guys and, and hopefully become part uh, of this global community uh, that's for everyone. everyone. Everyone is welcome and no comments. <laughs> good stuff. That's what I like to hear. And communities are so good for, like, I genuinely think, yes, you have that like, baseline of theory um, that I kind of like I was taught in like a formal setting. But realistically, like I've learned a lot of what I know from other people and like listening to them tell their stories or, or build their projects. So, yeah, really, really impressive. Thank you so much both. So, yeah, please join in um, on, and get to know the global AI community. I thoroughly enjoy being, a, being a, a, a member of the global AI community and hearing what everyone's got to say. Amazing. So we are on to our last segment of the show. We've got around 13 minutes left, so we're doing good on timing. And I'm going to be joined again by Adam, our incredible host, as well as by Emily Clark. So, hey, both. Uh, it's okay. to frame. <laughs> I was going to say, find where the, the, your spot is. Um, amazing. So this uh, this segment, I wanted to round off. So we've talked about developers. We've talked about data scientists. And we've seen those kind of two different perspectives um, and some of the focuses that they're looking at. We've talked about community and how we learn. But now I want to specifically talk about learning and skilling. And Emily, we're going to start off with you. Emily, can you tell us... Um, uh, who you are and what you do at Microsoft. Yeah, hi everyone. So if you tuned in last week, you'll know that I am a developer product marketing manager here at Microsoft UK. So my job is to support our wonderful developer ecosystem, uh, both from a community perspective and also from our customer standpoint too. Very nice, very nice. And um, I know we've been chatting a lot about you getting into AI. I feel like I was bugging you for quite a long time, but I'm so glad that you've <laughs> come over to the dark side and uh, you've decided that you're going to spend a little bit of time. And so you've been di diving into the AI fundamentals learning paths on Microsoft Learn. Tell us a bit more, what are they uh, and, and kind of what have you been doing in that space? Yeah, sure. So I guess... About a year ago, I probably did the Azure Fundamentals, and that was really good for like the broader sort of, you know, cloud computing knowledge. But I really want to take that next step and learn a lot more about specific technology. And AI for me is such a buzzword at the moment, like everyone is talking about it. But I think for me, I didn't necessarily really understand completely what it meant and what it meant to me. Like when I go online shopping, I can see someone's trying to sell me some more stuff and recommend new products based on whatever's in my basket. Or maybe, um, you know, using a chatbot instead of having to pick up the phone and speak to someone to ask them a question um, from like a, a company standpoint. But actually, I, like this has given me such a good fundamental baseline knowledge of AI now. And it's sort of what I really enjoy doing is having sort of a mixture of videos, text, and also these incredible data sets where you can actually get hands on with the experience yourself. Um, and admittedly, it took me a little bit longer maybe to get going with it, just purely because I'd never used uh, Azure Machine Learning Studio before. Mm -hmm. And the Azure portal was maybe I hadn't used it for a little while. So it took me a little bit to get through that first sort of module in the learning path. But once I'd done that, a lot of the concepts are very similar. A lot of the steps are the same. And I found myself quite quickly thinking I was some sort of AI ninja, being able to do loads of things really quickly. And the result was really impressive. Like as someone that has never coded before, I was able to do some really cool stuff with AI. So yeah, thank you for pushing me onto it. I would 100% <laughs> recommend everyone else gives it a go, particularly if you're uh, you're new to AI. It's, it's got really good sort of different examples that allow you to to learn by getting hands on with this technology. Amazing. And I guess, um, yeah, it's so interesting that you say like, oh, now I understand like actually what's happening. Just a caveat, Emily, I've been here for a while. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't stop you from buying exactly what they send you in targeted marketing and advertising. If anything, oh, it's only 
I know it's only made my shopping habit worse. <laughs> now it's so targeted that I definitely want whatever they're going to recommend for me. But um, exactly. it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's fascinating to kind of hear that perspective and, and also to hear that you, you got into it um, fairly quickly. I know we had a chat during that first module that you were taking and I was like, hold on, Emily, like, you've got this, like, don't worry, just keep going. Um, and then you told me, like, a day later that you were then flying through the next one. So it's so, so, so good to hear that. And Adam, thank you very much. This is the web page, isn't it, for the certification. Emily, are you going to go and try and get certified, do you think? Yeah, you know what, 100%, because I feel like I've I've got started with it. I've really enjoyed it. I will 100% do the certification for you, Amy, and I will uh, I'll pass it, and you can be a super proud parent. Um, but there's also so many other things that you can uh, do as well once you've done this. And I know there's a data fundamentals. Obviously, that's not specific to AI. But if I think about when I get to speak to all our amazing customers, they often collect all this data and don't always do something really clever with it. And actually driving sort of efficiencies, helping save money and also giving customers a really like great experience from utilizing this technology. Um so I want to definitely do the data one. And then if I'm feeling a little bit cocky, I might give the AI engineer learning path a go. Oh. Maybe I'll leave that to the experts. <laughs> big stuff, big stuff, Emily. Goodness me. Don't, dream big. It's always, always good. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, it's so amazing to hear. And then I guess fi final thing on that one. Um, you, you're obviously still going through some of it. I know you've done the majority of it now, but um, are you finding that it's helping your day job immediately? Like to having these conversations and stuff like that do you, do you feel like you can have a, a, a stronger point of view or a, you know you just feel confident in what you're saying almost yeah it's really sort of grounded those concepts for me and helped almost like look under the hood and say I know what the output is for AI but how does all of this sort of how do we get to that point and that's what it's really given me is the confidence to know all the different sort of like basic steps that you would need to start implementing this technology and to also you know have confidence when I'm talking to other people about it um, again like speaking to customers just being able to talk about how they can get into it and, and start to give it a go to is is really really cool so thank you for encouraging me to be uh, part of this <laughs> no no it's amazing it's amazing that you've, you've found the time right we all <laughs> we all have a million things to do and and so you've been working really really hard to do that kind of extra learning I think yeah having a goal and like knowing what you're going for that's the way that I tend to try and find that space for myself to learn as well um, and then Emily, you should, you sh we should have you back on the show, or maybe we can get you on the AI talk show that the global AI community does, and and kind of share your story if you start building something like that's it's getting it's dangerous. No, 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 no not at all. <laughs> this is the thing, right? We we, we don't want to always see. I saw a tweet this morning. And it was like, oh, we don't want to always just see the the old familiar faces. Um, we just want to see we want to see pe new people come into the space and and just talking about that you don't have to be an expert to give a session you just have to be you have to be able to say this is what I've done and this is what I've learned so for everyone out there actually that's learning AI um we've seen how important the community is like please do go and share just always always share because something that you think is very very obvious someone else might not I remember learning so much one time about um, the Jupyter Notebooks experience that I like didn't have a clue about before. It was, uh, oh, I always use Jupyter Notebooks. And then uh, Jupyter Lab was like another part. And then Cassie on our team was using Jupyter Lab. And I was like, I've like never tried this. And I, re I really, really liked it. Like it was a really good experience, but I just hadn't like had a chance to get into that space or, or try it out before. So like, yeah, everyone's, everyone's sharing this space. There's always something new. So if anything, no one's an expert. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Adam, I think you uh, brought me on to a little thing though in Microsoft Learn that I actually never knew was there until like yesterday. So um, can you talk to us a bit about customizing our path and actually how people can find AI content if they're getting started? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the thing about Microsoft Learn is that there's a, there's an awful lot of content on there, and I think when you, you know if you go on there, it can be quite tricky sometimes to find exactly the module that you're looking for because you know there's new ones coming out all the time, and there's already a huge catalog of resources. So um, what I always recommend people to do, I, I, I always say this: um, log in 
to Microsoft Learn. It's it, it, it will track how you're doing. It, you'll see your progress. You can customize it. Now, I'm actually logged out at the moment on here just, just so that we can see, um, see the screen. Um, and this is what you'd get if you came into Microsoft Learn and um, and you weren't logged in at all. You get a general list of things that, uh, that we think is cool um, across different technologies. But what I would recommend is actually clicking on Customize My Path. And it's going to ask some questions. And so, I mean, this is a total lie. Um, but let's say <laughs> I am a like a data scientist or data, data engineer. Let's just say data, let's say data scientist. Yeah. Oh, it's not like we rehearsed this or anything like that. Advanced. <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> definitely. Uh, let's go for intermediate. Yeah. Um, and I am interested in, um, let's say I am interested in Azure. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, do you want to pick another one for me? Uh, yeah, let's go for Power Platform as well. Power Platform. That's an interesting we, one. We, yeah, we love, I'm, we love power. We got the power. I was going to say, um, we have got the power. And I'm mixing these two things together. And it's an absolute treat. Like, oh, yeah. nice. There we go. We've actually got now learning paths and modules that are intermediate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is really important because Microsoft Learn does have a lot of beginner content. So if you already know something about your topic, and I think that we, and we, touched, on, we touched on this last week when we were talking about Python, um, mm -hmm. there's loads of resources for learning Python because Python is such a good language, uh, programming language to learn if you're a beginner. Um, but actually, if you're already experienced on Python, it can be a bit frustrating because you actually just want to cut to the more interesting, juicy stuff. So, um, you know, customizing and editing your interests is really, really important here. Nice, nice. And so in that, um, in that like original setup, we saw like data scientists, uh, data engineers. So thinking more about those who prepare data and data yeah. warehousing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then there was also obviously developer, um, and yeah, we, I mean, I could analysts, change. There's so many. Should we say like student and beginner? Um, you can come to my um, level, Adam. <laughs> oh, not having any of it. Um, uh, yeah, you're going to get completely different. Obviously, this is we've not really chosen an AI topic here, so this is giving us all yeah. sorts of like principles of cloud computing. So it is it is going to um, it is going to vary, um, you know, massively depending on what you uh, what you click in. I think you know, data engineer, um, beginner. That's probably the sort of thing I would be interested in at my level. Nice. And that's where you start to get the uh, the you know the the beginner content there. That's really cool. And so being able to access a new space or build on what you already know, um, yeah, not something that I realised was actually there. I would um, always go in and scroll, scroll, scroll. I mean, we're all used to right, just general scrolling on a day to day basis, but um, it, I felt like I was doing that in Learn, and I actually didn't realise that was there. So that's really amazing. I might go in and um, do take my own quiz and see see what we can do. Um, cool. So we are nearly at the hour. I can't believe it's been 58 minutes already. Um, so yeah, just a, a massive thank you to everyone that's joined us today. So um, Jamie, Tempest, Edwig, uh, Sammy, uh, Emily, and also Adam, thank you so much for having us all in your in your cloud skills show space. Um, yeah, it's been an absolute treat. And Adam, you said we can get links from somewhere. Where where can we get all these amazing links that everyone's been sharing? Absolutely. So I've just put the link on there. So aka.ms forward slash cs dash show three. Um, we'll have that updated just after the show with, uh, with all the links from today. Um, and you can also watch this episode back here, complete with the 30 seconds where we disappeared in the middle. <laughs> and uh, thank you for everyone that stayed with us throughout. throughout. But uh, yes, we um, we will always publish the the, uh, the documents each week as well. Um, it just helps, uh, you know, when, when we're moving through, it's a live show. We don't always cover absolutely everything that we could. So they will contain some bonus content as well. Very, very cool. Well, thank you so much for having us, Adam. I'll let you see us out of the show. Oh, well, thank you very much. I mean, you've already said goodbye to everyone. So thank you very yeah. much for everyone, that uh, you know, for, for all of the guests today and for all of you watching. Don't forget, you can watch us every week, two o'clock UK time on Learn TV and the Microsoft Developer UK um, on YouTube. But thank you, everyone. And um, for this week, at least, it's goodbye. Don't forget, pop back next week. We'll have a security special. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. All right. Bye.